Don't tell me everything. So, the part that goes inside the absolute value is the goal number. That's what you want it to be. The part that goes outside is how much it can vary by, right? Which kind of makes sense because absolute value is the distance from zero, right? So this is the distance of how off you can be. So it's still kind of going along. That's why we're using absolute value to do these types of application problems. Because the amount you can vary by, that's a distance of how far off you can be from something. So what we're using this for is how far off you can be from your goal number. That's why we're using it. Does that make sense? So you have your goal that goes inside your absolute value. You have how far off you can be. Now, to be consistent with what I've taught, I went through and I solved the absolute value equation the way that I taught you to solve them. But honestly, you can just take 400, add 24, subtract 24. There's your two numbers. That's like the easiest way to solve these. Okay. On my answer keys, I did not do that because I wanted to be consistent with how I taught you to solve absolute value equations. Okay. So I was consistent with how I did that. But if you want to cheat and do it the easiest way, because these are always very simple equations, then you can cheat and you can do it the easy way because these are, um, they're less like order of operations backwards, lots and lots of steps. They're a little, they're less like that. And they're a little bit more common sense than the equations that we solved the other day. Okay. These are, these are math problems that you could probably give somebody a few years younger and you could say like, Hey, if it's five, but you can be off by two, what are the two numbers? And they'd be like, three and seven. You know, they could figure it out. Okay. And all the problems are that way. So if you guys want to show less work, that's fine. Um, I do want you to write the sentences, though. That's probably where you're going to use your brain the most. You're going to be like, today is like math and English combined. It is. Okay. All right. Um, any questions on this part right here? Did this part make sense? want to talk about it a little bit more. So instead of them saying, hey, here's the goal number, instead of that, they said, okay, here's the very lowest number we could have. Here's the very highest number we could have. You figure out what the goal number it was and you figure out how off we were allowed to be. So if they gave you the very lowest and the very highest for you to figure out your goal, you just have to take those two numbers and find their average, add them together and divide by two. So adding them together and dividing by two helps you to find the middle of the, those two extremes. The middle of the two extremes is the goal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So average, middle. So add them together, divide by two. That's how we find this number. And then if you can find the distance between the two numbers, just subtract them to find the distance and then take half of that distance. And that tells you how far you can vary by. Okay. All right, so on the back side, it's just doing the same type of work, but the formula is a little bit more complicated. So you have your experimental value. So that's like, have you guys done, um, like you've taken science classes where they have like, we have all these really clean math formulas, but then you get into the science experiment and nothing works out quite as clean as it's supposed to. You actually have the decimals. It's, it's never the whole number. Um, that's kind of what they're saying here is we have like the clean math formula, but nothing ever works out the way it's supposed to. So we've got the theoretical value that we're going to plug in here, but then you've got the experimental value where in the real world it never actually works out the way it should. And so you can plug all those numbers in and then multiply it by 100, and then it tells you the percent of error, which is how far off of that perfect number you were how far off of that theoretical value you ended up being. Okay, so this next problem um, is taking that idea a little bit further, where instead of just plugging in all the values you have, they start you off giving you that percent error, and you are solving for like an experimental value. You are solving for this as an X value. So again, we're taking um, an absolute value equation and we're solving something, okay? So here they're saying a piece of equipment designed to fill food bags with dry food fills nine ounce bags. So nine ounces is the goal. 
That's what we're expecting to have. So that's a theoretical value. That's the perfect number. Are they all going to be nine ounces exactly? No, because if you were to take um, bags of cheese puffs and weigh every single one of them, they're not all going to be perfect, right? They're going to be like about nine ounces, but not perfect. Okay, so that's the theoretical value. Let's go ahead and label that. Theoretical value. Okay. And the percent error is 2.2%. 2.2%. Is that more focused? Eh. I feel like it's just as blurry as it was. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in um, all these values to my formula. I'm going to use, uh, so percent error is 2.2% equals the experimental value, which I don't know because they didn't give it to me. That's what I'm solving for. Minus my theoretical value, which is 9, divided by 9, times 100. Because we solved um, absolute value equations. So now we're solving absolute value equations in the context of an application, like a word problem, mm -hmm. but we've already solved absolute value equations. No, I mean, like, in, like, earlier classes, stuff that was like You might have done stuff like this in, like, a science class. Statistics, maybe? Um, the percent error is not uh, is not math specific. It's it's a, a statistical idea. So if you've talked about statistics in a class ever, it would not surprise me if you've seen that formula before. Yeah, solving the equation for an x right here though, I'd be surprised if you'd done it in another class. Yeah, I don't think you've done. I don't. I don't think you've done that part. But the formula itself might be familiar. Yeah. All right. So now we've got that set up. That's not too bad. Now for this one, this, these are not as easy to solve as the previous page. So the previous page, we can just be like, oh, common sense. Your goal is 400. You can vary by 24, add 24, subtract 24, easy peasy. These ones, we actually have to go back and think about our order of operations backwards. Can you add or subtract something over, over? Can you multiply or divide something over? We actually have to do the process on this one. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and write my equation to start with. And the easiest step to do first. And the nice thing about this, at least, um, because I don't know about you guys, but this, this one makes me feel a little bit less comfortable both because it has the 100 on the outside, which is kind of a big number, and then also because it's got division inside. And I think most of us, when it has division in a problem, we feel less comfortable with those fractions, right? Most of us don't like that. Uh, the nice thing is the 100 can be taken care of pretty quickly. What should we do with that 100? We should divide it. So I'm going to go ahead and divide it over. So if we were thinking of this, if we were relating this to the day um, earlier on in the unit when we were solving uh, absolute value equations, we always said, okay, first, can you add or subtract something to the other side? And the answer to that question would have been no. There was nothing easily that could be added or subtracted to the other side as a first step. Then our second question would have been, okay, is there something that we could multiply or divide? And the answer would be yes, we could divide the 100 over. And when you are doing these questions, the 100 is going to be the first thing you're going to take care of every time. It's going to be pretty consistent that way, okay? So 2.2 divided by 100 is you take your decimal, you move it two places to the left. That's how dividing by 100 works. So it's 0 0.022. And then I've got absolute value x minus 9 over 9. And then what is the big thing we have to remember about absolute value equations? A negative and a positive, there's two. There's always two, okay? So once the absolute value is written alone, this is the point where I write two of them. So I'm going to do the negative version. And I'm going to write the positive version. Uh, 
Now, when you have a negative um, with a fraction, you can put the negative on the top of the fraction, you can put the negative on the bottom of the fraction, or you can put it in the middle. So for me to be consistent with my process on this, I just decided to take the negative and put it to the top of this fraction. Okay, so what I did is I just took the negative and I said, okay, I'm going to call this negative x minus 9 like that. I'm going to put the 9 on the bottom. And the reason I did that um, was so that, so that my first step for both of these could be to multiply the 9 over to the other side. Does that make sense? So when you have a negative in front of a fraction like this, you could take the negative and move it down to the bottom. You could keep the negative with the top. And I decided to leave it with the top so that both of my equations would have a positive 9 on the bottom. I know, I, I decided to keep it positive. Because I could have taken this negative and moved it down here and said that both of the tops had an x minus 9. I could have done that. Because your negative has to go somewhere. You have to commit to which side of the fraction you want it to be on. And I'm just letting you guys know that my strategy was to move it to the top. It's on the top. This one, because remember, we have one negative version, one positive version. The right side is the positive version. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you put it on the bottom, then you're just going to have two different values over here. It doesn't change your final answer. I'm just telling you that I did that because I liked to have the positive on the bottom. I'm just telling you why I did it. Okay, so let's do 0 0.022 times 9. All right, what did you guys get? Yeah, you gotta trade me a cell phone though. Or an ID card. Or your car keys. Yeah, I know, but I have a thing. I have a thing. Yeah, you can get it out. Yeah, get it out. No, just get it out. I was saying if you want to borrow one of mine, you gotta trade me something. Okay, 0 0.022 times 9, what is it? 0.198. All right, so we've got equals 0.198. So I'm going to go ahead and distribute that negative. So I've got negative x plus 9. Are we comfortable with that? And then over here, I multiplied the 9 over. Now I've just got x minus 9 equals 0.198. Um, so this process I'm doing with you guys, it's not the only process you could use to solve the problem. So different math teachers might have handled that negative and that fraction in different ways. Okay. But this way that I did it, when you check your answer, when you check the answer keys later, this is consistently how I did these problems. Okay. So if you consistently follow these steps, your, your, um, process will match up with my answer keys. You are welcome to handle the negative however you want to handle it, okay? It's not the only right way to do it, all right? Okay, so what should I do next here? Minus 9, okay? So 0.198 minus 9 is negative 8.5. Eight oh two, okay. And then over here we're gonna add nine. That at least is easy. A uh, whole number with some decimals is nine point one nine eight. Okay, so we got this number. Uh, negative x equals uh, negative eight point eight oh two. So I'm just gonna divide by the negative, which is gonna make both sides positive. Are we comfortable with that step? Cool. Okay. So back to the context of the problem. So we had um, cheese puffs. They were supposed to be in nine ounce bags, but the theoretical value that we could find 
when we go and we weigh all of our bags um, with that 2.2% 2, 2, that 2 .2 error factored in, um, we could find bags that at a minimum weigh 8.802 ounces and at a maximum weigh 9.198 ounces. So we're still finding a minimum value of a weight and a maximum value of a weight, but it's with using that 2.2% error. So they're not telling us how much it varies by, they're just using that 2.2% error to figure out how much it can vary by, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and write my sentence. The bags of cheese puffs Yeah. Uh huh. So since they were both negative, it's like I divided by negative one on each side. Uh huh. Yep, they were both negative. Yeah, because I had a positive point one nine eight, and I subtracted nine from it, and so it made it negative. And then when I had both negatives, I just divided. So if we do nine, so we're gonna say, yeah, so nine times point zero two two. Yeah, yes you could. That was a good question. Madison, that is how it works. You cracked the code. So Madison said, hey, couldn't you just figure it out what 2.2% of 9 is and then just add and subtract that? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. Um, the reason we're doing it is because I had not asked myself that question before Madison asked it of me. Um, also, it's probably valid to know that that formula. That formula is probably good to know. Um, well, so so the, it depends on the way that you're tested on it. So if, if somebody says you have to write the equation, then you're going to have to know how to write the equation. If someone says you have to solve that equation and show your work, then you have to solve that equation and show your work. So, and and it's a difference of... Are you showing work for how you got the answer where Madison's way would work? But if it says solve that equation, then you have to know how to solve that equation. And if I, let's say that I didn't give you this context, let's say I just gave you this equation to solve, right? Like this is the context where it came from, but I didn't give you the context. I just gave you an equation like that to solve and said solve it. And we know like, oh, that's that one formula. That's where it came from, that one formula. But you're uncomfortable enough with this type of equation that you can't solve it, that's not good either. We should be able to solve an equation like that. So I'd say it's good practice. So there on the assignment today, there are two of these. I'd say maybe solve one of them the way that it's meant to be solved like this. And then if you want to try Madison's way to do one, you can do that. So no, that was a good question. That was good thinking on your part to recognize that's what was happening. Yeah. Um, I did not think of it that way because I've, I've heard of, there's a lot of different ways to calculate error. In math, there's like a different way to calculate error for a lot of different things depending on the context. And I've seen percent error in other situations for calculus, but I had not seen this formula before. I didn't even think about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that was really smart. Yeah, that was a good way to think of it. All right, any other questions? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and give out your assignment.